Welcome to Space News from the Electric Universe, brought to you by the Thunderbolts Project at thunderbolts.info. Forty-two years ago, on separate dates more than two weeks apart, two spacecraft were launched at Cape Canaveral, Florida, with the potential to rewrite our understanding of the solar system and the interstellar environment. In the 1970s, the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 spacecraft were designed with the intention of studying the environments of Jupiter and Saturn, as well as the gas giant's respective moons. In 2012, scientists announced that Voyager 1 had apparently become the first man-made object ever to reach interstellar space. But what the spacecraft told us about the behaviors of the solar wind and the conditions at the interstellar boundary did not match space scientists' theoretical predictions. In 2013, the lead author of a paper in the journal Science told Wired.com of the Voyager 1 data. The models that have been thought to predict what should happen are all incorrect. We essentially have absolutely no reliable roadmap of what to expect at this point. And today, scientists have reported that Voyager 2 has now also recently crossed the boundary into interstellar space. And again, the theoretical predictions based on standard solar physics do not match discovery. Don Gurnett, the corresponding author of a study published in the journal Nature Astronomy, said to phys.org, In a historical sense, the old idea that the solar wind will just be gradually whittled away as you go further into interstellar space is simply not true. We show with Voyager 2, and previously with Voyager 1, that there is a distinct boundary out there. It's just astonishing how fluids, including plasmas, form boundaries. Of course, the predictions of the Electric Universe theory about the interstellar environment and behavior of the solar wind differ dramatically from convention. The Electric Universe has always proposed that a vast Birkeland current enters our solar system and, in fact, powers the sun. We asked retired professor of electrical engineering, Dr. Donald Scott, to offer his overview of the Voyager 2 findings to date. Well, a few days ago, researchers at the University of Iowa announced that space probe Voyager 2 left the sun's heliosphere in late 2018 and entered what they think is the interstellar medium. Its sister probe, Voyager 1, did that earlier, I think it was back in 2012. And they announced that this latest transition was signaled definitely by a, and they emphasized a strong increase, a increase in the plasma density measured by the probe. In other words, the probe essentially went through uh, they, what they refer to as a wall, a boundary there between the heliosphere uh, and the interstellar medium. Well, these guys, uh, astrophysics in general, is still in the mindset of fluid dynamics and gravity only. So. You continuously hear words like winds and shocks and bow waves and uh, in fact one typical uh, astronomer commented on this latest release he said quote in a historic sense the old idea that the solar wind will just be gradually whittled away as you go further into the interstellar space is simply not true uh, no kidding <laughs> we show with voyager 2 and uh, previously with voyager 1 that there is a distinct boundary out there, it's, it's just astonishing how fluids, including plasmas, form boundaries. Well, yes, in a sense, plasmas are fluid, but fluids are not plasmas. So, uh, they, and do they form boundaries? Yeah, you betcha. Again, it, they seem to be surprised when they shouldn't be surprised. We in the electric universe realize that the discovery of an increase in the plasma density is completely consistent with the electric Bessel function model of a Birkeland current. So we're not surprised at all. The electric universe model of a of star formation, that is how the sun formed, is that it results from a, a Z pinch in a Birkeland current filament inside our galaxy. And in our model, in the EU model, matter, uh, that's to say ions, electrons, neutral atoms, molecules, etc., form in concentric cylinders. So it's quite probable that the outer cylindrical layer of the Birkeland current is a region of increased density. And so that's what the EU would have expected. And it, we don't look at it as, as a surprise or a discovery. It would be something we would be looking for. It's also true in the uh, classical plasma lab experiment. Alfian did them, Langmuir did them. Uh, there is often a double layer of charge 
just outside the cathode, just above the cathode. It's called the cathode drop. And in the case of the heliosphere, um, the heliosphere in the Electric Universe model is the outer layer of the heliopause. It serves as a virtual cathode. And so thinking of it that way, we would expect to see an increased density of matter just at the cathode. And in our model, the heliopause is the cathode. So that again is what we would expect to see. Z pinches have been long observed in plasma labs throughout the world, and there's nothing exciting to us about them, but it's very nice to see our ideas born true and see that the, that's what they're seeing. But at the risk of boring people, I think I ought to point out yet again that when both mechanical and fluid processes occur in a region where there's also electrical forces involved, those electrical forces are 10 to the 36th power times stronger than anything gravity by itself can produce. So electricity is very important, and these folks have got to learn that. There's a slide there that says the sun's environment. And on the left of the image, there's a sketch showing how the twisting current density and magnetic field tend to flatten out into a disk as you get closer and closer to the actual location of the Z pinch. We're looking sideways at what the electric universe thinks is the Birkeland current that serves the sun. And that oval there in the middle is the, what we would say would be the, the heliosphere. In the center of that diagram, you see sort of an X-ray photograph of that Birkeland current and the, and the heliosphere. The outer edges are the, is, is defined by the words edge of the Z-pinch filament cylinder on both sides there. And so that's the, that sort of yellow cloudiness is those increased ions and electrons and that sort of thing that, that de demark the, uh, the, the extent of the Birkeland current. And in the center is the heliosphere. The sun, a very tiny dot right in the middle of that. That is a reasonable sort of a schematic of what the electric universe thinks is the heliosphere and the way the, the sun is situated. But uh, actually a, a better image, the hourglass shaped nebula M29. And it's, I think it's perhaps the canonical example of a cosmic Z pinch. You can see many of the aspects of what I just said in that, in that image. And you can see there's at least two visible layers outward along the Birkeland current. And the locations of two possible double layers are easily seen there. The M29 is a visible plasma entity. And as such, it has to be, of course, in plasma that's in arc mode or at least glow mode in order for us to see it. And if you look at the top of that image in the very bottom, you can see that the plasma is beginning to disappear. It's beginning to turn into dark mode because the electrical uh, current density is lower the farther you get away from the, from the Z-pinch. Clearly, our uh, Birkeland current is in dark mode, because otherwise you would, you would see it. Well, if you take a close-up look, again, a schematic of, uh, looks like uh, there's some black lines that show the shape of the Birkeland current on either side of the, uh, the Z-pinch. You notice that with those lines form together that I, I'm suggesting that uh, it looks as though the heliosphere itself is more of a sort of a, <laughs> I hate to use the word flying saucer, but that's what it looks like. It's, like. it's a sort of a squished sphere and point A is inside of it. And if those two probes followed a, the path A to B or A to C, they would have left the heliosphere, but however not left the Birkeland current. Had the voyagers gone from A to D, that is straight out, they would have left both the heliosphere and the Birkeland current and gone out into the truly interstellar space. And you notice on there, there's a notation about electrons combine here with solar ions to form ENAs. The IBEX mission, the satellite on which the mission depended was a product of the Lockheed Martin Corporation and the division of that Lockheed Martin was a, headed up by the late Dr. Jim Ryder. He's a valued electric universe scientist, engineer, and I will say a good friend to many of us. We miss him. A report of the mission's initial results by the main, mainstream said, the interstellar environment has far more influence on structuring the heliosphere than anyone previously believed no one knows what is creating the ENA, the energetic neutral atoms, ribbon. 
Now, this is what Ibex discovered, is that there were these energetic uh, neutral atoms that they hadn't expected to find just outside the heliosphere. Well, see a picture there of what a classic plasma experiment would look like in the laboratory with the anode on, on the left and the cathode on the right. And of course, you put a higher voltage on the anode and ground the cathode. And what happens? Well, if you do it right in the middle of the tube there, around somewhere where it says positive column, neutral atoms are ionized by le electrons coming from the cathode. And so you get an ion. Ions are produced in there. And the positive ion, that is to say, what's left of the atom minus the electron that's popped off of it, it starts to move toward the right. It'll be attracted, it's, it's positive charge, attracted by the cathode and repulsed by the anode. So eventually you get the, the stream of positive ions heading toward the right, heading toward the cathode, and flooding out from the cathode are a stream of electrons. And what happens? Well, they recombine. There's no such thing as a positive ion traveling in the wire that goes out of the cathode. It can't do that. So where the, uh, the positive ions end up are being neutralized by those electrons coming out of the cathode. And what, what's the result? An electrically neutral atom again. And so that's, there's nothing magic about these electrically neutral atoms. These ENAs are formed simply by recombination. And I, I interject, my friends, it's an electrical process of the recombination of the negatively charged electron with the positively charged ion, and that's how you get the electrically neutral atom out there at point D. One of the most, I think, most interesting things to come out of this experience is that on October 29th, in 2015, NASA, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, issued another press release, and they said, Voyager 1 has now helped to solve the interstellar medium mystery. Uh, I'm not sure what they were referring to by the interstellar medium mystery, but anyway, the quote from the release that I find extremely interesting is, Now researchers have found that the direction of the magnetic field has been slowly turning ever since the spacecraft crossed into interstellar space. Okay, they say that again. They have discovered that the direction of the magnetic field that the spacecraft observes has been slowly turning, rotating, ever since the spacecraft crossed into interstellar space. What they should have said is ever since the spacecraft left the heliosphere. But because, as we saw in that previous diagram with the three uh, paths, A to B, A to C, and A to D, they left the heliosphere, but stayed inside the Birkeland current. That's exactly what they would have observed, because as you travel through a Birkeland current, the magnetic field slowly rotates and slowly changes its direction as you proceed farther and farther away from the central axis of the, of the current. One of the most important properties of the Bessel function model of the Birkeland current is that inside the current structure, the direction of the magnetic field continually increases. Therefore, this announcement is a supremely important in agreement with this inherent property of the EU. And my conclusion is that the two spacecraft, or at least anyone that measures that continually rotating magnetic field, followed a path like A to B and A to C. That means they have not really entered the interstellar space they're still inside the Birkeland current. They've left the heliosphere, that's true, but until that magnetic field stops rotating the farther out they get, they're still inside the Birkeland current. So there's several different points of confirmation of our model and not theirs. These astrophysicists have got to stop talking about fluid flows, shocks, and bow waves, and they have to learn that the real entities such as Birkeland currents and double layers are important. And until they do, their research will stagnate just as their fruitless search for dark matter has. These people have to begin to learn about electricity in the cosmos.